Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to PNP Live at Lunch. I'm Heidi Lewis from Politics and Cool Bookstore in Washington, DC. Thank you so much for tuning into our event with internationally renowned grief expert and therapist, Claire Bidwell Smith, for a discussion of her book, Anxiety, newly available in paperback. And she's joined by the spectacular Rebecca Soper, CEO and co-founder of Modern Loss and co-author of Modern Loss, the book. Um, before I bring them up, let me see a show of hands. How many of you are tuning in for your first virtual PNP event today? All right, I can't see you. <laughs> I can't see you, I can't hear you, but I can hear from you as the authors can as well in the chat box over on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you're not seeing it, just sort of hover your cursor over that and it should light up. And you're welcome to join in, have a conversation, say hello. We wanna know how did you hear about this event? Where are you tuning in from? Um, we're also glad you're here. And if you have questions for the authors, that goes in a different place. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see something that says, ask a question. That's where you pose your question for the authors. Um, Claire and Rebecca are gonna talk for a half hour or so, and then they're gonna pivot and start taking your questions. So answer, so um, en enter them into that little box down there. And if you don't have a question, you can still take a look and see what people are asking. You can upvote questions that you really want them to answer. Or if like you don't want them to answer something, you can downvote it. Um, but but keep an eye there and and please enter your questions for them. This is an event for you, and we know how important this topic is, and um, we know a lot of people are really hurting right now, and um, we want you to to get something out of this event. Um, let me think. One more thing. Right, right, right. Um, before I bring the authors up, if any of you have video or audio issues that persist throughout the event, try refreshing your browser. This Crowdcast is, you know, like everything else, just so overwhelmed with internet use right now, it can get a little um, wonky. So just refresh if anything happens. And worst case scenario, this whole event is being recorded and will be available to watch either from this link on our Crowdcast page or later when it goes onto our YouTube page. Um, I have talked a lot, so I'm really excited to bring um, the main <clears throat> events up onto screen. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm almost speechless at how to introduce them both because I found them on my own grief journey um, when I lost my mom almost six years ago and was thrust into this new lonely space and just completely without anchors and without rudders. And I found these two and I found the Modern Loss community and I was just so saved by it all. And Claire's new book, Anxiety, just really puts into perspective what these wild symptoms are that we can have from grief that aren't explained, that aren't addressed. And it just presents such a crystal clear and calming map for how to deal with the overwhelm, the panic, the anxiety, everything that comes from this horrible experience that is lost. So please, if you haven't already, buy this book. It's so, so wonderful. And maybe buy it for someone else who needs it right now too. Uh, you can see the green button at the bottom of your screen that says purchase anxiety, the missing stage of grief. And if you click on that, it will take you right to our bookstores um, buy page. So, um, I'm gonna stop talking. I'm so excited to get this started. Um, bear with me for a second while I bring the authors up on screen. Here we go. Here is Rebecca of Modern Laws. And here is Claire. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Claire. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you both for being here. Um, I'm gonna take myself out of the chat and let you guys get to it. And just thanks again. Thank you so much, Heidi. And thank you to Politics and Prose. We're so excited to be with you guys today. I'm so grateful to independent bookstores right now for just continuing their, their work and continuing to you know support authors and books. And I'm so glad for all of you guys being here to support independent bookstores. So thank you. That's right. I always go to IndieBound before anything else. So thank you for coming on to Politics and Prose. It's 
by far my favorite bookstore in the DC area and one of my top bookstores in the entire country. And it always makes me feel very smart to be associated with it because of the name. So um, anyway, I'm just, I'm so glad to be here. As Heidi said, my name is Rebecca Sofer. I am coming to you <laughs> theoretically from New York City, but for the last two months, I have been in the Berkshires in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, in a very rural part, part of Massachusetts. And I am so, flattered to have been asked to be in conversation with my very good friend Claire um, who has inspired me so much over the years with her work I just love I devour everything she writes um, <laughs> like if I could kidnap her and have her just like like go through life with me it would be illegal but it would also be very comforting to me because everything is so smart that comes out of her mouth and i just think her book um on anxiety which she sent to me in galley form a couple of years ago um it's so dog-eared <laughs> that, <laughs> that i need like i definitely need another copy at this point um so claire um you know thank, thank you, you. i feel all the same things about you and I, before, I'm gonna interrupt you already because we're good friends and I can do that. Um, but before you start, I was just listening to Heidi introduce us and talk about finding us on her grief journey. And it's so meaningful to me. And your work has been so meaningful to me. And then to hear other people who are grieving and going through this, finding us, you know, this is why I write. This is why I wrote the books I wrote because they weren't there when I needed them. I felt very alone in my grief journey. And so um, I'm so grateful for the work you do and for Modern Loss. I send everybody to Modern Loss. It is such a vital resource. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, so let's um, let's spotlight your work because it's, I would say it's always needed, but I think these days it's <laughs> more needed than ever, probably by every person who's walking above ground at this moment. Um, my baseline is anxiety, like is functional anxiety for anybody who's ever met me. And it's functional, it's okay. I'm a New Yorker, it's fine, it's part of the deal. But um, when I read this book a couple of years ago, so many bells went off in my head and so many things made sense. There were so many holes that hadn't quite been filled um, with regard to my own personal experience and just everything kind of clicked when I went through your pages. So can I just ask first and foremost, why, you know, you've written books, you, you're such a prolific writer, you're also a grief counselor, I mean, you're a therapist. Why did you decide to write a book specifically on anxiety as it relates to grief? Um, you know, it's, it's, such a, it's such an interesting topic, like you said, especially these days. When I wrote this book, I never imagined that there was going to be a time when it came out and the whole world happened to be going through it. Um, so it's been, I've just been talking about it more than ever in ways that I hadn't anticipated. But for me, you know, my, my personal story is that both of my parents got cancer when I was 14 at the same time. I was an only child. My mom died when I was 18 and my father when I was 25. Right when my mother died was when my anxiety surfaced. I started having panic attacks, hypochondria, you know, social isolation, all kinds of different manifestations of anxiety. I ended up in an ER once, you know, thinking I was dying and it was anxiety and panic attacks. Um, and at that time, this is over 20 years ago, no one connected those dots. No one said to me, you know, oh, what are you, what's happening in your life? What are you going through? None of the doctors I talked to, none of the counselors at school really pinpointed that my anxiety was stemming from all of the grief and loss I was going through. And it took a lot of my own work. It took my own study of psychology. I ended up getting my master's in clinical psychology. I worked in hospice for a number of years, um, counseling people who'd been through loss. And even that it was it was until then that I even connected the dots for myself and I because I started to see it in everyone I was working with I started to see that when people go through a significant loss often they also experience anxiety as a result not everybody um, but many many people experience anxiety after going through a big loss and either they were already anxious to begin with and the anxiety ratchets up or they've never been anxious and suddenly like me they were finding themselves in the ER having panic attacks um, and so I began to write about it in little bits and pieces, in articles online, and um, <coughs> I started to get this influx of people saying, oh my God, is this real? Is this a real thing? Anxiety and grief, because I think I have it. <laughs> Can I come see you? And suddenly my office was filled with people who were um, in anxious states while they were grieving. So I got to really study it firsthand, and I felt like this book was really necessary because it wasn't being talked about anywhere else. 
But again, I never could have imagined that when it came out, it would um, be during this time when we all are experiencing grief and anxiety. I mean, even if we're not losing someone directly right now, I think we're all experiencing new levels of grief and new levels of anxiety that go with it. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so much to talk about always with this, but I think in the last couple of months, there are just so many people who are being so triggered by old grief, by old trauma, um, mm -hmm. in ways that they kind of thought that they had put to bed a long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess I'd like to just really start jumping into like the current landscape that we're all I don't know about thriving, but surviving in at this moment. I mean, yeah. we were both like just pushing our children out of the house just so we could do this event. We're juggling a lot. Um, <laughs> we're just like barely keeping our heads above water. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, what is it that you're hearing from people these days about how their anxiety is manifesting with regard to grief, but like against the backdrop of this whole pandemic? and not necessarily people who are like losing people to mm -hmm. coronavirus, but who have had old losses. What, what are the, some of the things you're hearing? Yeah, I think a lot of old losses are definitely being triggered, whether you lost someone you know, in childhood 25 years ago, 40 years ago, or recently um, this pandemic and the environment that we're now in is um, very conducive to bringing back a lot of that grief and a lot of that anxiety. You know, I think that anxiety is linked to grief because when we lose someone we love, it it reminds us or makes us realize for the first time how uncertain life can be, you know, that we can never quite um, know what's going to happen. We don't know how long we're here for. We don't know what's around the bend at any moment. And that's what we're going through right now in this pandemic. You know, we, we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know um, how we're all going to fare. We don't know what's going to happen. And so to wake up every single day in that amount of uncertainty is very anxiety inducing. You know, we, we're just constantly existing in this space of not knowing what's happening. Um, and I think that finding ways to counterbalance some of that uncertainty, finding ways to ground ourselves, finding ways to soothe ourselves, to get support when we need it is really important. Okay, well then thank you for um, asking my next question for me. You're doing my job. Uh, you know, what are some of the ways, you know, you and I, as we're good friends. So we've had a lot of conversations about our Michigas, you know. Um, I'm just wondering, what are some of the things that help you when you are just like, and I think you just hit the nail on the head when you said it's really hard to wake up with uncertainty every single day. Um, you know, grief is uncertainty because it's wondering what your new normal looks like, how you're going to make it a place where you can really live your life as best as humanly possible and not just keep your head above water. Um, grief is just full of uncertainty and hence anxiety because it's just this other utter lack of control that we have. But now we're all feeling grief, you know, like every single person on the planet is feeling it. And so we're waking up with the uncertainty of like, will our kids ever go back to school? Will I ever go back to work? Am I ever gonna go on a date again or like kiss anyone again? Like, is that ever gonna happen? So that's a lot of anxiety, um, not just for people who are dealing with grief, what are some of the tools? Because I think a lot of people are on this conversation because it's, you know, this topic is resonating with them, not just for personal death loss reasons. What are some of the tools that have helped you and helped some of your patients, um, you know, that maybe you can share with us so that we can have a toolbox ourselves? Yeah. Um Mindfulness and meditation have been the most helpful tools for me personally and for so many of my clients. And it's what it's it's just the way you described, you know, when we're grieving either now in this pandemic, but also just in general grief, when we lose somebody significant, um, when we lose someone we love, we spend a lot of time thinking about the past, what led up to that loss, what our relationship was like, things we could have done differently. And we spend a lot of time in the future thinking about what's going to happen now, questions, fears, doubts, playing out different scenarios. We spend very little time in the present moment, you know? So finding techniques and tools, which are often meditation, any kind of meditation is so helpful for this, to bring yourself to the present moment. How are you today? How are you right this moment? We're spending all this time in our heads in things, playing out scenarios that haven't happened yet, you know, or just wondering about all kinds of things. 
And I think when we can bring ourselves to the very present moment and just get centered, get grounded, um, not let ourselves dwell in those disaster scenarios, that's one of the things that happens when you've been through grief before and then you're going through something like this. You spend a lot of time catastrophizing, going to those worst case scenario places so easily. So learning how to catch yourself and realize that you're in the worst case scenario spot and pull back from it, you know, be compassionate with yourself about having gotten yourself into that thought that that thought pattern, and then bringing yourself to the present moment. Anxiety is the fear of something real or imagined. Mm -hmm. Right now we have, both, you know, we have a very real pandemic, but we also have a lot of imagination about how it's going to go. And for those of us who are familiar with grief and loss, we tend to go to pretty catastrophic places when we think about it. I mean, your story, uh, for sure, you know, you lost both parents and, and, and I think that having it, ha it just be in these sudden ways and, I, you know, I, I imagine that you are very familiar with catastrophic thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, <laughs> for, that, for those for people who aren't familiar, can you tell a little bit about your story? Sure. Um, so when I was 30, my mom was killed in a car accident. Uh, I had just been in the car with her. My dad was in the car with her as well. Um, it was about an hour after she dropped me off at my apartment. Um, my father survived. But that was kind of my entry point into this whole new world of, you know, navigating uh, life and and death, <laughs> um, and very much wanting to be alive and and thrive and have everything that I ever wanted in life and achieve all of my goals, but also like toe the line between um, trying to achieve them while being doing it against the backdrop of having the rug pulled out from under my feet emotionally and structurally. You know, I suddenly lost. The person that was most important in my entire life and everything was rejiggered like the dynamics among my family members um how i viewed career and friendship and really all different types of relationships it was just all of a sudden the landscape didn't look at all familiar mm -hmm. um and it's interesting because i could say the same for what we're going through now which is all of a sudden the landscape does not look familiar at all. We don't understand what's happening. We don't know what tomorrow looks like. Um, three years after my mom died, uh, my dad had a heart attack and he died as well. So that was definitely not my plan in life, <laughs> um, but it's the way that things things went and it's why modern loss exists. It's something that I you know, um, would have never chosen to pursue probably in a million years. Uh, I was on the political satire production route, but it's something where I just felt like there was so much power resting in storytelling and sharing and expression and not relegating this kind of conversation and topic to like special corners of society. Um, because for me, that was actually upping my anxiety. It was, it was making me more anxious to feel like I could only speak in a therapist's office or, you know, in hushed tones. Um, I wanted to feel like I could talk about this with friends. I could talk about it with my coworkers or whoever I was dating, you know, in a way that didn't make it feel like their record was coming to a screeching halt. I didn't want to feel stigmatized. Um, and I felt very stigmatized and there was no need for it. You know, it took me a long time to realize that there's nothing to be embarrassed about. Like this is just life, you know, and life is messy and death is messy. So why isn't grief messy, you know? Um, and so modern loss is just a platform about community and post-traumatic growth that can come out of this whole mess. And, and I know that's very much what you do as well. Um, and it took me a long time yeah. to find my team, you know, and to get my tools. I, I did a bunch of different therapies um, until I found one that really worked for me, which per personally was EMDR, which I, I, I was, you know, it really did wonders for me, but a lot of mindfulness and a lot of, like you said, remembering for me, the biggest key is whenever I spiral is to remember to come back into the moment and check in and just like ask myself, okay, am I like in actual danger right now? <laughs> like, is someone about to kill me? Okay, mm -hmm. if not, then chances are like at the very least I can handle this. Um, is everyone around me safe? Okay, great, okay. I can get through the next like five minutes and then let's see what the next five minutes look like after that. So my biggest key for myself is going micro whenever I get so overwhelmed. Um, I know that you shared a trick with me um, a few months ago when the world looked very different and you were 
saying uh, about something that you imagined in the future that calmed you down. Can you share that trick with sure. the people on here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I want to say really quick, <laughs> I keep not answering your questions, but I'm going to. Um, We're there. <laughs> that, like, I love you anyway. About your story and, and hearing you, you did everything the right way. You know, like the way you talk about how grief is so messy and unwieldy and you sought out support and you sought out ways to talk about it and to share your story. That's so important. And when we don't do that, that's when anxiety can surface because we're pushing down all this grief, all this sadness, all this pain and fear. Um, so finding ways to talk about it, to find communities with it um, is so important. And, and that will also help with anxiety. Um, but the trick that I that I love that's been helpful for me, um, you know, my parents died of cancer. So I'm, I, I tend to often worry about the same happening to me and I'll have something small happen, like a, a pain in my side. And I'm immediately before I can even stop myself, like have gone all the way to the scenario where I'm in the hospital bed and I'm dying and I'm saying goodbye to my kids, you know, just from like, it goes okay. from zero to 60, you know, pain in my side, probably like a gas cramp or something, right. you know, like immediately <laughs> saying goodbye to my kids, like steel magnolias. Um, and what I learned to do was when that happened, catch myself, have some compassion. Like, you know, it doesn't help to beat ourselves up when we're trying to change behavior, when we're like, ah, you're doing it again. Instead of getting to that place, just, you know, having some compassion for why you tend to catastrophize. And then I would make myself imagine a future scenario in a positive way. So I, in, I would reverse that, that negative image I was doing and start to think about maybe being at my daughter's wedding 30 years from now and make myself play it out just as viscerally and in as much detail as I had been doing with the disaster scenario. And I found that the more frequently I did that, the less power the disaster scenario had, and it started not to come anymore at all. Um, and I was also letting myself imagine really positive things that are helpful mm -hmm. to us. Yeah. I, I love that trick. And I've used that a lot since then. Um, I, uh, I I guess I'd love to know, we're, and we're gonna take some more questions. By the way, you guys, um, there's a whole ask a question widget. I'm currently familiarizing myself with Gradcast as we speak, um, but please feel free to put your questions in there because I'm gonna be sharing them with Claire in about five or six minutes and we'll have a good 30 minutes for questions. So um, please put them in there. Oh, great, another one. So anyway, Claire, what I would like to know is um, we're all stuck at home right now except for in some states that are deciding to, to reverse that. Um, and so the isolation is kind of compounded. Um, you know, we're of course all connected virtually, which is wonderful because it's probably saved my life multiple times in the last couple of months. But you know, I'm stuck in my house. I can't hug people. I can't feel people. I, I'm, a, I'm a hogger. I like looking at people in the eye. I need to like share a drink with people. I need to go to my office. Um, and I, can't, I need to take my children to school so that I can go to my office. I can't do any of these things. So, you know, everything is heightened now. And some of the things that we have been able to develop as coping mechanisms for anxiety, even in people who have really learned how to manage anxiety. Um, let's say we're used to, you know, going to like Barry's boot camp, which I could never do because I like almost throw up every time I try and do that. Um, power to anybody who can handle that workout. But you know, let's say you're you're going to somewhere very specific that is now off limits to you. And that is now suddenly taken away from you. Um, how do you replace that? Like how do you fill in these holes during a period of time that is still an uncertain timeline? How do you create a stopgap for you know the the like the black holes now that are kind of existing um i think that that's such an important question because so many of us are going through that i've heard stories of so many people who are isolated alone right now people who are losing loved ones and then grieving in isolation um we're losing our um ability to maintain our usual customs sitting shiva having wakes funerals memorials like these things are so huge um, to not be able to do right now i think we have to get creative i think we have to tap into our um, sense of ritual. I think we have to tap into our own spirituality. I think we have to explore places within ourselves that we have never explored perhaps. And 
I think it's an amazing time to do that. All, there's this, all these people are kind of talking about being productive right now. How productive can we be with this found time? Or let's bake bread and work on our abs. And um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I have not worked on my abs. No, I haven't either. Like I mean, I've worked on making them bigger, um, like, like eating too much. But um, Hilarious. I think what would be really productive is if we were kind of working on our inner life a little more, because we have to right now, we have to learn new tools, new strategies, new sense of ritual um, around how we cope. And I think that, you know, I think that beautiful things that always come out of these hard moments. Um, there will be awful things that happen and there's so much pain going on, but there's also really beautiful creativity that's happening in transformation. And I think we have to lean into that and allow for it and be curious about it, you know? Yeah. And I think that there's also a lot to be said for, um, and we'll move to some questions after this, but, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people who are, people are dying all over the world. And I know a lot of them, unfortunately. Um, and I know a lot of those survivors and they're being forced to come up with new rituals for, you know, things that are, that they've never needed to be reinvented until now. Um, I don't know, you know, I wasn't around during the Spanish flu. Um, although these days I feel so old that I, I might as well have been <laughs> I'm just so tired um, or the black plague, but you know, there are there, I can't think of any other time when we haven't been able to gather physically as a community and support each other. Um, and so I have been really moved by all the, all the creative ritual that has come out out of necessity of the last couple of months. And I've actually been doing a lot of writing about it for modern loss and on modern loss. Um, and so if anybody is interested, just, you know, there are a lot of pieces on how to move through this um, while keeping your sanity and also recognizing that, you know, we're not trying to throw platitudes at you and say that this mm -hmm. is, you know, it's okay. You can always just like do a virtual altar or like Zoom with people. It's like, no, it's not as good as the real thing, but it is meaningful and there are ways to create meaning and make yourself feel a little bit less insane. Um, and that's what our community is here for. So, all right, we have a bunch of questions um, and I definitely appreciate SW, her cousin broke her wrist doing Barry's boot camp at home. So that just <laughs> proves my point Amazing. that um, I should not do that workout. Anyway, okay, so let's just start, Claire. Are you cool if I ask some questions? Yeah, let's all do right. it. So we have one, any suggestions? This is a good one because we're all working from home, working. I worked for like 37 minutes this morning um, and we're managing kids and you know other things and dogs and whatnot. Um, so this woman wants to know any suggestions for having conversations about grief and anxiety at work, especially right now. We've had focus groups on our team, but it's all about logistical challenges, not emotions. Um, that's a really good question because now good. more than ever, <laughs> employers really need to honor and respect mm -hmm. uh, the fact that the, work, the, the lines between work and personal life, they're not only blurred, they're like literally obliterated. They don't even exist anymore. So how can we do this? I mean, I think it's really vital. I think that there's a couple of great resources out there that can be helpful with workplace. Um, I know Cheryl Sandberg has done a lot of stuff around grief and the workplace. So she may have some helpful resources um, on the plan. Is it, wait, option B, is that the name of their yeah. um, thing? And then there's another really great company called Lantern that you can look up that works specifically with grief in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of resources that you could take to your boss or HR. I would also suggest finding articles that talk about um, the emotional side of grief right now and circulating them with your boss, with your coworkers, mm -hmm. having conversations about them that way. I bet you guys have a bunch of great stuff on Modern Loss too. We do. We have a lot of stuff. We have a lot of articles about not just for, um, you know, you as an employee, but for employers and managers to mm -hmm. uh, on the importance of recognizing this. Um, you know, we also have a really active closed Facebook group, which is wonderful. Um, and there's a lot of chatter on there about how to support each other, how to bring up these topics to our managers, because what I found personally, I know you didn't ask me this question, but um, what I found is that if you don't draw your own line, somebody else is gonna draw them for you. Mm 
-hmm. And you should be very aware of that. And right now we're making up this entire script as we go along. We have no idea what we're doing right now. And so you might as well take control of that narrative and think about like, check in with yourself. What do you need? Do you need some time off? Do you need, you know, um, some unpaid leave? Do you need a flexible work schedule? What do you need? I, ask for it because right now we're all just trying to survive and, and you need to advocate for yourself. And I think in an ideal world, um, companies would intuit what everybody needs when they're going through some adverse times, but we all know that that rarely to never happens. So I wish you luck with it. Um, and definitely it's not just about logistical challenges. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Um, you mentioned that older grief, old or, and older grief is being triggered by this pandemic. What, it, what about new personal grief that has to, wait, let me read that. What about new personal grief that has to exist in this pandemic, grief on grief, if you will, is the coping mechanism the same? You mentioned meditation. Are there other physical and emotional symptoms that we should be mindful of and address? That's a great question. I think, you know, there's so many layers of grief happening right now. I think that we are, you know, like Rebecca said, grieving, or we're talking about this with uncertainty, grieving our kids being home from school, grieving summer plans we had, grieving just the regular life that we miss you know, that we were getting to have three months ago. Um, so there's that kind of grief. People are grieving jobs. They're losing companies that are, you know, falling apart. Um, we are grieving, you know, as a whole too, just watching the world go through this is terribly sad. Um, so even when we're not losing someone directly, we're, we're experiencing that grief. Then we are losing people directly. I know a couple of people who've lost family members already. Um, and so there's that grief. And then I, um, I think that we have to name it as grief. I think we have to recognize that we're grieving. I think a lot of the symptoms are similar. You know, all the emotions that come with grief, which are guilt, anxiety, anger, depression, sadness, um, all of those things I think are normal and, and you know, we're all experiencing them right now. There's so many great books out there um, about grief, how to navigate it, how to go through it, how to normalize what you're feeling. There's amazing online support groups cropping up everywhere right now for grief. Um, there's great communities like Modern Loss, Reimagine, where you can go and just have more conversations about grief, read more articles about it, just kind of understand it. And I think that that will always be soothing to someone who's grieving. Um, physical symptoms, a lot of anxiety kind of physical symptoms, uh, panic attacks, racing thoughts, racing heart, sweating, nausea. Um, those are all symptoms of grief, crying. Um, so I think that just being really kind to yourself, not trying to make it go away, really naming it as grief and understanding that. Yeah, that's a good, what you just said was really good, naming it. Naming it really takes a lot of the charge away sometimes, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Like saying it out loud um, makes it feel less scary and a little bit more manageable. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, uh, question from Theodora. Oh, hey, out of Theodora. LA. Hi, Theodora, <laughs> I know you. Um, so yeah, we're all on the Mother's Day hangover. Any advice for an emotional hangover um, from Mother's Day and the ongoing collective grief? Um, yeah, I think that like Mother's Day is always pretty crappy. Um, even if you have kids, <laughs> it kind of sucks when you're missing somebody. If you had a miscarriage or a stillbirth or a mother figure, it's not just any a mom, as we all know here. Um, and so it can be just like not the best day and it looms large for a long time beforehand. It's not just Sunday, right? It's yeah. when Jiffy Lube starts promoting Mother's Day specials, which is like ridiculous, but they do it starting in mid-March. So it's like we're bracing ourselves for so long and, um, and now we're coming off of it. But now we've also come off of it while not being able to say, have brunch with our best friend or do some of the things that we might ordinary, ordinarily be doing um, to cope with this day. So I, that's a good question, Theodora. Yeah, hi, Theodora. Um, yeah, I, I'm definitely coming down off the Mother's Day hangover. Um, I think that, you know, going through these, it's, it's, it's similar to when you lose someone you love and then you have to kind of go through that year of firsts, you know, first birthdays, first anniversaries, first holidays without that person. And right now we're going through the first things during the pandemic, right? So this was our first like kind of 
Mother's Day during the pandemic, which was totally different in many ways. None of us were going out to brunch or doing all those things. And then the grief that's triggered if you don't, if you've lost your mom and feeling all of that during Mother's Day. I think, you know, we have to find a careful balance of grieving and then also just not steeping in it all the time. Mother's Day is gone. We all, like a lot of us showed up for mother loss events and discussions and the grief and we honored our moms. And um, I think now we need to do things that are healing and happy and sometimes distracting. It is not a bad idea to do some distracting things right now, like doing things, watching, you know, comedies and reading good books and cooking and spending time, you know, outside if you can and just doing things that make you feel good. Uh, we can't steep in all of this stuff for too long or it's really going to weigh us down so much. Rebecca, what do you think? Are you still hungover from Mother's Day hoopla? I'm so glad it's over. <laughs> it was not my favorite day. Um, also it snowed, which is just stupid. It's the middle of May. Um, and I think that's inappropriate <laughs> that it should be snowing up here in Massachusetts. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm really glad it's over. And I've already come to realize that I just don't like Mother's Day. It's just not my thing. Um, I like getting flowers and I like getting macaroni necklaces, but I just have realized that um, it's not good for me to put so much stock into one day, you know, like a birthday or, you know, someone who's, who's, who's died, you know, their birthday or their death anniversary or something, because it just does a number on me. And I just kind of realized that it's no, for me, it's actually no different than any other calendar day. It's the, it's the meaning that I'm ascribing to it. And so I try, like you say, like I name it out loud and then I, that lessens the charge for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just kind of go about my day without making plans. And someone said something really great to me a few years ago. They said, just let the day be the day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, God, that's like the smartest thing I've ever heard. And it's yeah. so easy to remember. It doesn't have any, you know, difficult vocabulary in it. Um, it just makes sense. Let the day be the day. It's just don't expect anything. Um, don't plan anything. Just do whatever you need to do in that moment. And that'll be the right thing for yourself. And so that's what I did. Um, and I'm glad it's over. And now Father's Day is coming up. So I'm real excited for that one. Um, anyway, uh, so let's move on. Um, this one got a lot of upvotes. Is grief, uh, sorry, is grief related anxiety different in specific ways from other types of anxiety? Good question. It is a good question. Absolutely. Um, and yes and no. In some ways, it's very similar to general anxiety. A lot of the same symptoms, the way it presents, you know, catastrophic thinking, um, hypochondria, social issues, you know, not wanting to be around people or um, getting phobias around that. Um, but often what I've seen is that the anxiety when you're grieving, either you're experiencing it for the first time, you were never anxious before, and then you've lost someone, and now you've really realized how precarious the world can be and how uncertain things can be. So you start to feel that sense of uncertainty and unsafety all the time in everything. Um, and it's stemming from the experience of the loss or you go through a loss that's traumatic. And so there's anxiety stemming from that. I think the anxiety when we're grieving, um, it, there's a lot of fear of more loss that comes with it. And that's something that has to be worked on pretty, pretty actively when you are going through this grief related anxiety is just really coming to terms with that fear of more loss. Rebecca, I'm sure you're familiar with that idea, you know, having lost both of your parents like that. And I'm the same, you know, I lost both of mine as well at different times, but close together. And it just feels like when you go through something like that, everyone's going to die, you know, <laughs> like right. that, you're just going to keep losing people. Right. Um, so working on things like that. Um, and then I think really addressing your grief is so important. What I have often seen when someone will come to me in my office and they, they come in because they've been having a lot of anxiety, they say lost their dad or sister last year. And when I sit down to check in with them, much of the time they have really not let themselves grieve. And whether that's because they were overwhelmed or afraid of the grief and didn't really know how to process it, or whether it was the messages they were receiving from the people around them that they need to move on, they need to be better, they need to get back to life. Um, a lot of times there's, there's some unaddressed grief that needs to be worked on. And so that's one of the things that I see that's causing the anxiety because when we push it away, and we don't address our grief, we don't allow ourselves to process it, it just spills out in all these other mm -hmm. places. 
anger, anxiety, frustration, you know, um, bad relationships. And so that's one of the things that I think is really tied to that kind of anxiety is that the grief is often there's, there's some stuff there that needs to be really thought about. You know, that book, that kid's book, we're going on a bear hunt. I don't you know. know. So it's a great book. <laughs> like most of the literature that I read these days. Um, it's a great book. And it's like, we're going on a bear hunt. We're going to catch a big one. It's a beautiful day. And then, oh, a river, a big, scary river. And you can't go over it. You can't go under it. The only way is through it. And it just reminded me when you're talking, like the only way is through it. There's literally no other way out than to just take a deep breath and address everything and examine it so that you're not in this purgatory of feeling like that forevermore. Um, I mean, that's that's at least been my personal experience. Um, so thanks for answering that, Claire. Um, the next question, <laughs> some big words in it, and I only had one coffee today. So <laughs> I'm gonna dive right in. Um, what is your sense on the reintegration of the body and mind with growing fields such as psycho, <laughs> As psychoimmunology and your own work. Um, this is a really good question, Cassandra. Do you think doctors are starting to get and understand that stress, grief, anxiety, and sadness manifest in physical symptoms? Also, do you find that when physical symptoms end up being attributed to mental or emotional states, that makes them less valid, quote unquote, in the mindset of the medical field. Would love your thoughts. That's a really good question. And I can actually corroborate that um, by saying that we have a whole column, we have a whole series on modern loss called Grief Bacon, which is based on a German word, which I'm not gonna pronounce correctly, Kummerspeck, um, which is like the weight that you gain eating when you're grieving. Um, and it's just kind of alludes, it's it's a metaphor, you know, it alludes to everything that happens to your body when you're grieving. I personally had to have a brain MRI because I actually thought I had a brain tumor six months after my mom died. Um, mm -hmm. And I had vertigo and I had stomach issues and I had so many different things and doctors couldn't find anything. And I just was kind of brushed aside until one of them finally said, it's just grief. You're just messed up, you know, like not permanently. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I am, but in other ways, you know, um, and so I think it's a really good question. What what have you felt about this? It's a great question. I think I think part of the answer to that question is, yes, they're getting so much better at at seeing that these physical symptoms are coming from psychological issues, whether it's grief or anxiety, um, because I see so many so many clients come to see me because they have first gone to a doctor or gone to the hospital with some kind of manifestation thinking they have a have a brain tumor or heart attack or a panic attack or they just have some kind of like ongoing you know ailment that is stemming from the grief or anxiety and these days i think that doctors are much better about saying you know what's happening in your life let's look at stressors could that be any of the, could that be anything contributing to these symptoms and often the answer is yes and so then they will direct them to go see a therapist um i do think the second part of your question yes i think they are a little more dismissive of those physical symptoms once they decide once a, a, a medical person decides that it is stress grief anxiety related i think they can be more dismissive and sometimes that's hard for for people because they're going through very real pain or you know very real symptoms that are causing them discomfort so i think we still have a little ways to go i think there's amazing um I think there's amazing kind of movements towards, um, you know, alternative medicine that I think are great, um, which are helping in that regard. But I think, you know, we have a ways to go, but it's getting better for sure. I mean, when I ended up in the ER when I was 18, which is 24 years ago, um, mm -hmm. I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> the doctor, you know, the doctor, they ran blood tests, they ran an EKG, they they asked me, like, do you take drugs? What do you do? They asked me all about my food. And then they never once asked me anything about like how I was doing in my life and what was happening. If they had, I would have told them that my mom had just died. Um, and so I think that that has come a long way since then. Mm -hmm. Agree. But it sorry, still has a baby screaming in the background. That's at my house. I'm sorry. I, I thought maybe it was I thought it was a Mayan, so um, I was just wondering if I had to run away. Um, yeah, I agree. I think it's come a long way, and I think it has a long way to go. I think that some doctors are empathic and 
aware. And I think that there's a lot more integrated medicine going on and the whole field of palliative care, of course, is growing. Um, I think doctors are being trained a lot better in empathy, but um, you know, I, I think like you said, if anybody had asked you what was going on emotionally, it would have solved a lot of issues. Um, and I'm sorry to read that so many of you also had brain MRIs. Um, <laughs> I felt like they were going insane. Um, at least I'm in good company there. Um, so here's another question. Can you address the difference between being in the moment and mindfulness in the face of grief and the problem of ignoring or suppressing it and not processing it in a healthy way? Similarly, what is the difference between processing and wallowing? That's a good, yeah, it's a good question. That is a good question. It's a little, I have to kind of tease it apart. Yeah. Um, the first part is a little confusing to me. What, what was your understanding okay. of the first part? Okay. So, so can you, okay. So wait, let me read it again. Hold on. Give me one second. Can you just speak uh, a moment? Okay. So I think that um, what is, I think she's trying to like, how do you toe the line between actually allowing yourself to sit and examine your grief um, in a healthy way? or you know suppress it and ignore it like where at what point i think she's trying to figure out like at what point does processing become maybe over processing and fall into wallowing that makes sense well i think wallowing i in my sense of that is that we can get kind of stuck in one place with our grief right or we can get really stuck in one emotion of usually anger or sadness around that loss. And we're just really stuck in that. And that's kind of our narrative all the time. And we let it um, we let it filter into all areas of our life. We let it affect all our relationships, our um, our day-to-day -day lives, our, our work. Um, and I think that when we process grief, we do actively move forward in different ways. And like we learn how to integrate the loss into our lives. And like Rebecca talked about, the steps she took after losing her parents. You know, I think that we have to seek ways to tell our stories. We have to seek community to support our grief. We have to explore those losses. We have to find new ways to stay connected to the people we've lost. Um, those are ways of processing grief and kind of moving forward in it. We never ever get over our people. Um, it's it's if, if anyone has ever told you that you should be over your loss or that it's been a certain amount of time and you should be okay now, don't listen to them. We never get Walk away. Over, yeah, we never get over our loss. Like this is your losses will stay with you throughout your whole life. It doesn't mean you can't live a happy, meaningful life, but you will always hold that grief and you will always hold that that loss with you. And um, so I think that that is one of the things we need to think about. But when we get stuck in a really in a place that's, um, you know, dampening our entire life because of it, that's when we need to do some work to kind of stop wallowing and to move forward. There's this whole school of resilient grieving that a lot of people talk about. Um, and I've always had a, a, a nuanced relationship with that because I, I don't want people to feel like they need to get over their losses. Um, but I do think we need to find ways to rebuild our lives, to move forward, to live meaningful lives despite the loss. Um, and I think that that is kind of what resilience means to me. Um, I I wish every day that my parents could be here and I miss them. And I think about my mom in particular all the time and I still have pain around that. But I also have a really vibrant life that I'm, I'm happy in. And I think one of the mistakes we make is that we think we have to pick one, that we have to either be sad all the time or get over our loss and be done with it and be happy right. all the time. We can right. do both. You know, we can be happy and live vibrant, rich lives and always miss our people. Yeah, I think it's a lot easier for society to kind of define this in binary terms, but that's just like not the way that any part of life works. It's one big mess. Um, so why isn't this a mess too with all these just as shades of gray? And yeah. I think within the black and white, you have gray and within the gray, you have a lot of different hues and some are darker and some are lighter and some are gonna be more prevalent on one day and others on another day. And that's just like living, right? Um, and uh, I think that's a beautiful answer, Claire. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we do have a couple more questions I'm gonna try and get to. Um, I did that one. Um, thank you, Heidi. How do I deal with a complete lack of motivation as I manage through losing my mom and grandmother within 14 months of each other? And I'm mm -hmm. so sorry, that's so awful. And I actually get it. My grandmom died six months before my mom died. And we were all best friends. Like we were 
they were like my people and it was the worst. So I'm so sorry. Yeah, I am sorry too. I think it's okay to have a lack of motivation following those kind of losses. Like you can't expect to, this is this idea again, that people want you to bounce back and like get back to your life. And um, this is where I rub up against resiliency in the wrong way, where I think that we we really have to take this time out. Um, it's, you know, maybe you can reframe it as not lack of motivation, but you know, a more internal time when you're healing and you you have a wound that you're taking care of. That's a psychological wound. It's an emotional wound. Um, and so that takes a lot of energy and it takes energy away from this idea of motivation, what you used to think of as feeling motivated. Um, you're still healing and that those are big losses to happen all at once. Um, so I think just going easy on yourself um, and doing what feels good to you, finding ways to honor them, finding ways to um, you know, create meaning in different ways, um, telling stories about them, coming to things like this. This I'm, this is, I, I think, one of the most healing things you can do when you're grieving and feeling in that kind of heavy, unmotivated place is come and be around people who get it. You know, I think one of the reasons it gets so heavy and we feel so unmotivated is because we have to be around people who don't understand what we're feeling. Um, and that can feel so just that disconnect that comes. So come to places like this, have conversations like this, participate in these things, go to modern loss. There's a, a million things there that you can really read about and feel, you know, kindred with. Yeah. I think that like, it's so much harder to carry all the burden on your shoulders in anything, you know, in anything in life, but especially something like this, which is ironically such a universal experience that I think it's just, Sorry, I think the clinical term is stupid, that it's a stigma, right, Claire? Is that what psychologists yes. call it? Okay, um, it's it's silly that it's stigmatized. It's ridiculous. We're just people living <laughs> universal experiences. So why can't we talk about it with each other? And so I find that if you can divide up this burden, this burden among so many shoulders, then and, and, and we can all carry it as a community, Mm -hmm. It just lightens our own load and totally. it makes it not better. Like you're never going to get over it. This just is cliche. You know, it's um, closure is a mythical term, but uh, you know, it makes it easier to, to move through it. And you certainly feel it's isolating no matter what, because no one has that particular relationship that you lost, but right. you certainly feel less isolated and you feel like you can just, at least scream into the cosmic void with other people who get it. And just knowing that is such a relief and it frees up energy that you otherwise, you know, might ordinarily spend suppressing all of those feelings. So that's my, that's my two cents. Um, okay. So what time? Uh, one, okay. We have a couple more minutes. Um, can you suggest, Oh, well, <laughs> someone, this must've been a plant. Um, Oh, feel, okay. I was just taught Heidi, we were, or Claire, we were just giving permission to go a little bit over because apparently you have lots of questions. Um, I hope you I guys are okay with this. Over. I, I, ha I can't go too much over, but okay. We can we'll go one minute over. over. Okay. Can you suggest online resources for grief and anxiety to help in this current environment? Um, well, I can. <laughs> can, you, <laughs> can you, Claire? <laughs> Yeah, well, modern loss is always at the top of my list because I get asked this question all the time. And it's just a wealth of resources that can point you in every direction. Um, there's other amazing sites. Reimagine um, has great things. It's got Let's Reimagine Death, I think. But I think if you just Google that. Um, but also really just do a simple, a simple internet search of your type of loss. I always think that that's really helpful too. If you lost a spouse, if you lost a parent, if you lost a child, there are organizations for every single type of loss. And there's such amazing organizations out there. Too many to list, you know, right now verbally, but there's, um, if you just do a simple internet search, it should yield a lot of results in terms of that. And I know that everyone in the grief world, Rebecca and I are so connected to everyone who works in this space in our country and we are all working so hard right now. I hope it's heartening for people out there to hear that I have never been busier in my entire career. And it's because I'm also collaborating with so many people in the grief space and we are trying to come up with as many platforms, virtual discussions, online support as we can do because we really wanna meet the demands that are coming and happening right now. Um, so there's a lot out there. Yep, agree. Um, okay, so I wanna respect your time, Claire. So I think we'll just take two more questions. Um, 
Any thoughts on combating loneliness and emotional pain in the face of such a difficult and isolated time, which has been compounded by our losses? And I know we did talk about that a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but it did get a couple of votes. So uh, can you briefly address that? I just want to acknowledge that it's very real. You know, that loneliness and isolation that's happening right now for people is very, very real. Um, there are people who are single, alone, in tiny apartments somewhere, you know, and they're grieving or they're just feeling this whole pandemic. There are people who are in homes full of families and they're still feeling alone and isolated. Um, I think that we're all going through it on various levels and it's very real. Again, you know, seek out these kind of communities, seek out this kind of support. There are virtual discussions happening all over the internet right now at awesome bookstores like Politics and Prose, um, with other grief support places. I know Modern Loss is doing virtual discussions. Um, I do a lot of them. Seek these things out. Um, spend a portion of your day w here with people like us because it isn't the same. I know it's not the same, but it's better than, than nothing. You know, And I, I really urge you to find that sense of community right now. It's true. It's better than nothing. It is. <laughs> um, okay. So Claire, I know that you have to hop. Um, I will do one more question and then I think Heidi wants to uh, close out. So, um, oh, here's a good one. Can you talk about the correlation between anxiety and fatigue or grief and fatigue? Because I think a lot of us are just like really tired these days. <laughs> Absolutely. I think if anyone has ever gone through a big loss, it's it's exhausting. Um, and we really feel it on a physical level. I think our brains and our hearts are on overload when we're grieving and when we're anxious. And just the capacity that we have to be present, to be awake, there's so much emotion going on. I always hear about people getting really forgetful when they're grieving or anxious, like they can't even remember what happened an hour ago. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because our brains are just on overload. Um, just taking extra good care of yourself. I know it sounds trite, but it is important. Trying to get enough sleep, really trying to um, put good things in your body. Exercise is so good. I think yoga is really great for grief and anxiety because it's it's not strenuous. It's not as strenuous as some kind of cardio exercise you could be doing. And it kind of brings you into that present moment inside your body. And I think that that can be really helpful in healing. Yeah, it's a great answer. Um, thank you so much. Well, it is almost time. I know that we have a lot of other questions, but I think maybe we can collect them. Um, you know, I know that Claire and I are in conversation a lot these days. So um, we'll let you know, hopefully through Heidi, uh, where the next next place we are is. And Claire, where can people find you, pray tell? My website, it's uh, clairebidwellsmith.com. And um, I have books there. I have online courses. I have meditations. Um, and I have events that are coming up um, where you can ask me more questions. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for all that you do. Um, and thank you, Heidi. Hi. I'm sorry. I made myself so big. And now you guys are so small. <laughs> okay. Don't need to see myself anymore. Um, well, God, this was just the perfect antidote to my Mother's Day hangover. Uh, thank you both so much. This was, you're both such warm and informative messengers to this like really scary world of loss. Um, this was just wonderful. So thank you to both of you. And thank you so much to our audience. Um, thank you guys. I yeah, this was great. And thank you for all of your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything. Um, I know a lot of you donated to our bookstore to access this event and that so many of you bought Claire and Rebecca's books that we've sold out. Awesome. Um, so I know. So hey, I'm doing, I put my email address in the chat and I'm doing it again right now so that you email me if you still want a copy and we will make sure you get one. Um, and you know, if you, if you enjoyed this event today, come again. Um, P and P Live at Lunch is part of our new midday event series, which is uniquely designed to help you thrive and find meaning. So, especially now, I know talks like these are really important. So, please check our events calendar if you're into events like this. And our next one actually is May 23rd at 1 p.m., which is Memorial Day weekend. But I think we're all going to be around. Um, so, it's Saturday, 1 p.m., with Dr. Lisa Van Susternen and Stacy Kalino, who will be talking about their new book, Emotional Inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to start off and thank um, all of you for tuning in again. And thank you so much, Claire. Um, this book thank is just you. 
And we were so happy to have you both here today. Thank you so much, Heidi. Yeah, Thanks, thank Rebecca. So much. Always love to see you. Love you, Claire. <laughs> bye, guys. And bye, everybody. Stay well read. Thank bye. you. Bye.